Jim Flaherty, welcome to the Biohacking Secret Show. Thanks, Anthony. Happy to be here. So this is kind of a funny story. I, uh, I've been playing around with some different softwares for, for podcast recording. Normally, we'd use Zoom. And with Zoom, you have to, like, when people join the recording, you have to give them access into the room, right? So I had, I had been toying around with all these different softwares. I was running a little bit late, and I was like, I got to get my workout in, at least get a good sweat before I sit down with Jim and record. <laughs> so I was like, it, it, it was one of those something's better than nothing workouts. So I'm like, I'm going to run for seven and a half minutes one direction. I'm going to turn around, run seven and a half minutes back, jump in the shower, and then, you know, we'll record. Well, I finish my workout. I come into the uh, uh, come into the area where we're recording here, and I quickly start, you know, throwing off my clothes with the exception of my boxers. And, you know, I'm pouring sweat. I'm all red from, from my niacin that I took pre-workout. And I look up. And we've got about 10 minutes before we're set, we're set to record and Jim's hanging out in the room and the new software just <laughs> lets you see everything. So I look and I'm like, oh, I've been stripping in front of my podcast guest. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you Fort- had... Yeah. Fortunately, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, unfortunately, I, I, I waited. I, I, yeah. I kept, I still had my, I still had my boxers I'm, I'm on. And everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I got, I got a shower and everything. You handled it. You handled it very graciously. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, um, no, this is going to be a phenomenal conversation today. You, you, you and I have been talking a little bit over email and I was very inspired by a lot of the, the, the things that you've done in your life, your mentality, your philosophies, and, um, before we kind of go into your background, would you mind sharing with the audience, how, how young are you, Jim? I'm the youngest uh, 86 and a half year old, you know, <laughs> I'm <going on> 60. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I almost feel guilty. You know, honest to God, Anthony, I, I really wake up every day feeling so good and ready for the day. And I don't wake up in pain <laughs> and I'm, I don't know. I'm looking forward to every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. 86 so. and a half. That's, and, 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 you know, part of why this is so exciting to me is because I love examples of people who are mentally, physically, spiritually fit that, that are doing, you know, so, so much of our society is, is just at, at, your youthful age content to sit in a chair and stare at a box on the wall. And you know what I mean? Just, just slowly allow their faculties to dwindle away. And then if something comes up health wise, they try to throw pills at it, you know? And, and so I love surrounding myself with living, breathing examples of people like you who embody the, philosophies in the way that I'd like to live when I'm, when I'm your age. I saw a funny, a funny line the other day, which I really like said in inside of every elderly or older person, there's a younger person wondering what happened. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Totally. um, I don't know. I, I didn't expect to live this long, but I, but I did. And I, and I, I do think to live this long, you have to have some discipline. You really have to decide, okay, if if I've been dealt this hand that that's allowing me to go on, then I better take care of myself. Yeah, so I do all that. I do all the right stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? I resonate with that Which too. Isn't boring. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. It's great. And 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 when you realize how how good you can feel, you know, when you realize what's possible with a little bit of discipline. It's it 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 really allows you to just experience more life, you know the 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 density and richness of the experiences that you're able to have. You know, a month of of a healthy life could you, you could experience things that take other people six months or years, or, or they're never able to experience because they just don't have the capacity. So maybe a good place for us to start out would be. Um, can you give us a little bit of your background and your origin story for our listeners who 
who may not be familiar with uh, your work. <clears throat> okay. Uh, going all the way back, I was born and raised in Coral Gables, Florida. I didn't see snow till I was 20 years old. And I <laughs> transferred from University of Florida up to Michigan State University. That was in 1955 to get a degree in communications. Now, strangely enough, in 1955, only two schools in America offered communications as a degree. Now, every roadside garage and chapel offers it as a major. <laughs> but uh, back then, only uh, Colgate and Michigan State. Anyway, at any rate, I went to Michigan State and graduated and came to New York City with degree in hand during a recession. There was always a recession in New York when I arrived. When I interviewed everybody and I got a job with Allied Stores Corporation and their executive sales promotion trainee program. And I was being paid, ready? Mm -hmm. $3,400 a year. Yes. I took home $200, $200 a month after taxes. That doesn't, no that doesn't buy you a, a, uh, two weeks in New York these days. <laughs> No, not these days. But and back then, trust me, I was not exactly living in a wonderful condo with views of the city. I I won't talk about my sub poverty apartments that I had. Did it hurt me? No, it didn't hurt me at all. And and I laugh now looking back because I remember it very distinctly. I would get up every morning so excited with the idea that I was able to get up and work and earn a living and go to work. And I went to work and I was taking home basically an, a dollar an hour. I would go to work an hour and a half early, taking home $200 a month. And then in later years, God was good to me and I worked hard and I ended up in corner offices. I can remember when I was earning $150,000, $160,000 a year in New York. I still went to work an hour and a half early. Mm -hmm. That was built into me. And that some well, yeah. of that stems from. Go ahead. Anthony. No, I was interested. I'm, I'm interested what, where your mindset was at at the time for you to be showing up a, an hour and a half early, even when you're making a dollar an hour. I thought I'll get there and I'll, I'll get going. I'll get my mind in the right frame of mind and I'll, finish whatever job I had, and I'll be available for any other work they have. I would take any assignment they got. Also, way back then, I found a quote from, of all people, Noel Coward, <laughs> that great wit and wag and actor and producer. And he said something that I totally embraced back then, and I still believe it now at age 86, with great line, work is much more fun than fun. <laughs> and it is. It really. It, I was not created to float around a pool with a margarita in my hand. Mm -hmm. I've done that, and I think everybody should do it now and then. Everybody should have travel, and they should have some fun and have some silliness in their life. But that can't be the end all of life. I totally agree. I think life to create yourself, you have to have a goal. You have to want to do something. Well, we'll get into that later when we talk about the book. I, I call it having a passion. And I don't mean the sweaty kind. I mean having a passion that gives you a reason to get up cheerfully every day, knowing that you can produce something, you can do something, you can move from point A to point B with purpose. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was really my background. And then I, I worked hard. I, I went into the Army. I still weigh, I can happy to tell you, I weigh five pounds less than I weighed at the end of basic training in the Army. And I worked at keeping my weight at that. Um, I got married while I was in the Army, earning $80 a month. I mean, that sweet girl must have been out of her mind because <laughs> <laughs> I had no guaranteed future. I did not come from a trust fund family by any means. Uh, although my father was district attorney of the city of Miami when I was a, a kid, when I was mm. like 12 and 13 years old. And I think he was earning $27,000 a year, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. you know? At any rate, um, we had children right, right away. I have 
two wonderful daughters who are this. You want to talk about feeling old when you have one of your daughters call you with loving sarcasm dripping from every word saying, hello, daddy, dear. This is your 60 year old daughter calling. (laughs) (laughs) So I have two daughters aged 60 and 62. um, And I'm very, very, very close to them. And I love them dearly. Uh, One of them lately said, daddy, you know, you can come and live with me. And I, told her I'd ra- I said I'd rather take gas. <laughs> said, I, I knew that most people have nice, friendly fathers, but you are, you know, ridiculous, but it's okay. <laughs> it's all we're great friends. That's beautiful. Um, That's beautiful. And you've written a few books too, haven't you? I've written a few books. I wrote two full length fiction novel, birth, death, romance, sex, international travel, Broadway, <laughs> pure fiction, which was, fun. I I think I wrote those as a challenge to myself. I'm going to back up for a minute. What I did to earn a living, I became a copywriter in the advertising world. Mm. And then in time, I became, if you remember the TV series, a madman. Mm -hmm. I was much, much better behaved than the people in Mad Men. (laughs) But I was. I was the corner office creative director. Yeah. And I did that for years, and I had a wonderful time with some great clients and tried to really do interesting work. I don't find most advertising that interesting to me anymore. But um, I decided one day, I wondered, could I write, other than 30-second and 60-second commercials, could I write a 350, 400-page book and <laughs> keep it interesting enough? So I assi- gave that assignment to, to myself wrote two novels, liked it. Now, I'm, today, I'm going to talk to you about a nonfiction book, which I think is more meaningful because I think it gives everyone, certainly everyone from age 50 and up, um, some good ideas for making every day worthwhile in their life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because I um, feel yeah. people should. Absolutely. And you know, out of curiosity, before we kind of get to your nonfiction book, so you got married, you're making um, not very much money, right? Did you ever ask your 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 ex wife what she saw in you, or what was it that really allowed her to take that leap I, of faith? I I really don't know. We met. Uh, I had been dating a girl down in Miami, and. She knew the Army was sending me up to, um, after basic training, up to Fort Meade, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., for Army Intelligence School. And she said, oh, call this girl, this Mavis Sherman. You two are so much alike, you'll probably end up getting married. I said, oh, yeah, sure, right, great. So I called Mavis, and eight weeks later, we were married. Wow. Now, uh, she was beautiful. She was an illustrator. I was a writer. We thought, Mm -hmm. nice combination. We both wanted to have children, and we thought we would have pretty children, and uh, <laughs> it would be a good and interesting marriage. And it was. We really had a very good time. They was gone, gone to meet her maker a long time ago. But uh, uh, it that's was, fantastic. Uh, very interesting. We both both loved the whole idea of having of having children. Were were you a big why people old, want to do Dave? that these days? I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I I'm I wasn't sure if I wanted to have kids, and now I'm I'm, I'm I've kind of changed my mind in that regard. Um, now, is is are there challenges associated with that? Of course, but I, I think some of the fact oh, that boy. you got to live through the kind of the the Mad Men era and be a part of it is fascinating to me. And I mean, did you see things that were a lot like the show and what's, and and what's portrayed uh, on TV or was your experience very different than that? My, my best friend, Susie, uh, we've been friends for 58 years now. Uh, She was a, a clone of me. She was a female creative director for another agency. And she said, Jim, it's true. People were getting drunk and laid in creative directors' offices all over New York, not in yours. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I was, I had, uh, still do. 
I believe in sanctity of place. You know, you don't tell an, an off-color story from the pulpit. You don't have a cocktail party in the AA meeting hall. And <laughs> you don't have unspeakable sex in the Oval Office either. <laughs> Because there should be some kind of sanctity into what you do. And in my office, my office was meant for solving problems with products or services and coming up with good creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And not, it was not uh, Las Vegas. It wasn't a party room. Yeah. I I, I read Ogilvy on advertising a couple decades ago, just just to make my own copywriting for biohacking secrets better. And uh, and that was that was one of many books that had a had a power, positive and powerful impact on my life and the way that I approach the, the, the written word. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about your book and um you know i want to just <laughs> for our listeners here before we dive in if you guys get value from this conversation if if you're enjoying the things that jim's sharing please share this episode share it with your friends family members coworkers anyone that will get value from it and uh that that means a lot that allows us to keep doing these interviews for free for you guys and uh yeah so share it up And then now, Jim, um, let's talk a little bit about your book. We've got some cool topics lined up here, but I'd I'd like you to (laughs) dear old friends. Dear old friends, a loving reminder, the band won't stop playing till you stop dancing. And I even put XO Jim on it because I wrote it as a love letter 44 years ago. All of my life, I had older friends. I, I mean, friends 20 to 50 years older mm-hmm. growing up. Now, at this point, at 86, obviously, I don't have many much older friends. <laughs> and and I, had, I wrote the book 44 years ago, smiled at it, filed it, forgot it. I was very busy. I had two kids in college, a new business. I was losing my mind. And I found it about a year and a half ago. I still liked it. And I suddenly realized, gosh, I'm one of them. I'm a dear old friend to many mm-hmm. younger people. So I rewrote and updated the book, writing it both to myself and to all of my friends and to everybody that I was writing back then. Because it's still valid what I was saying to people, which is get off your ass and live. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I Recently, by the way, uh, Anthony, I saw a piece of research that killed me. It said that I'll be a little wrong with the numbers, but not too far off. 75% of people over the age of 65 are watching a minimum of 40 hours of television a week. And it killed me. I mean, I like television too. I love to see a Turner classic movie or a special. And I certainly watch 10 or 15 minutes of the news at the beginning of the day and 10 or 15 minutes in the evening because I have to know what's happening in the world. But God, 40 hours of television. (laughs) It it makes my, it makes my heart hurt. Oh, I I thought. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't call it the boob tube for nothing. At any rate, at any rate, I, I wrote the book. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's not what I call a, a sample of brilliant writing. I think I've written other things that are uh, perhaps better written, but this is a nice, friendly book. It's a kind of book you could give your your nice old conservative grandmother if she's still reading, and she would say. This is very nice, and I got an idea or two out of it. I think everyone who reads Dear Old Friends is going to have one, two, or maybe ten ideas Mm -hmm. to be a better person themselves, to be a better parent, to be a better grandparent, to be a better friend. It's really about having a better life. Can I back up for a minute and Please? talk about something? You can talk about whatever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, I want you to interrupt me. You're the host. Of <laughs> um, 
my my late great mother, who was widowed twice and uh, was a terrific woman. I, I had no older siblings and my father died when I was 14 going on 12. So mother had a very strong impact on my life. And fortunately, she was really a smart dame and a terrific, she was a terrific broad <laughs> and <laughs> funny as hell and very much a lady and a nurse. And from, by the way, Centralia, Illinois. Now you sound like Don she Draper. Grew up on a, farm, a farm in Southern Illinois. Mm-hmm. And she used to say to me, every morning, every morning when you go, you have an opportunity. You're going to have to face your biggest critic, your harshest critic, the biggest obstacle in your life. It could be one of your best friends, but normally it's a very difficult person. It's that person in your bathroom mirror every day. And you have a choice when you see see that person. You can close your eyes and grimace with pain and say, good God, another day. Or you can smile sweetly and say, good God, another day. Mm. I know it may sound a little hokey, but I do that. I say, Good God, another day. I woke up on the right side of the grass, and I have another opportunity to do something good. Mm -hmm. Not just for myself, but hopefully for somebody else, too. Maybe I'll write something good. I'll I'll make a phone call to people I know who are having problems. Mm -hmm. I'll send some emails. That's all part of this getting over this pandemic thing. Everybody should do that Mm -hmm. anyway, too. Keep in touch with everybody because they people need companionship right now. They need a, a friendly word. They need a friendly face. You know, I, I, so I, I do totally that every agree. day. I say good, good God every day, and set out. I, I was on that that quick run I mentioned earlier, and you know, I I, I just. I, I go, I wanted to unplug. So I didn't want to be listening to music or doing anything like that. I just kind of wanted to be, I'm reading this book called running with the whole body. And it's all about connecting mm. all of the different kinetic chains in the body right. so that you can, you can right run down. more, more. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal book. And, um, yeah. and on, on the way home, I, I use that as like my, my time to say a little prayer of gratitude. And, you know, thank God for all of the things that I already have in my life and, and thank God for all of the things that are, are, that, that are on their way to me. Um, and, and, you know, I, I try to verbalize it as if it's all already there and I'm thankful for it. You know, even the things that maybe aren't quite there at this point in time and space, if that makes sense. And, and, and it's beautiful. You know, you're getting sun, you're exercising, you're saying, thanks and 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 expressing that gratitude and uh it's a very special time for me so i, I love the way that you kind of handle that each morning yourself too and say yeah i mean i mornings are very i love mornings anyway at nighttime i make a list by the way of the six or seven most important things i want to do the next day mm-hmm. and i try to put them down if possible in a priority list and put it either on my keyboard or my computer or on my bathroom sink because I know those are the two places I'm going to see first thing in the morning. I like that. And I really try to knock those out first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I know that I've really accomplished the hard stuff and then I can concentrate on some of the things, maybe things that I want to do even more. Mm -hmm. But I also think part of every day has to be some kind of discipline. I am, I admit, Cheerfully, I am a very spoiled person, Anthony. Not that I was born to be spoiled. I didn't have a silver spoon and I didn't have trust funds or anything. I worked hard. I made some good decisions. And 22 years ago, I hired a sweet little Mexican lady to come live under my roof. Mm -hmm. She's still with me. (laughs) I call her my nanny. (laughs) She nannies me. Yeah. And. Uh, it, it, and by the way, two weeks ago, she became an American citizen, which oh, really pleased both of us. A that's lot. great. Uh, and, and in the morning I get up and I roll out of bed and I turn around and make my bed. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started doing this before the wonderful Admiral McLaren wrote his book, Make Your Bed, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful book or speech that everyone should hear because it, it's such good sense. It is really good. And Esther, my nanny, said, you know, Senor Jim, I will make your bed. And I said, you know that someday you're going to have to, but for the moment, I still can do it. So I make my bed every morning, mm -hmm. and I come out, and I have just fresh fruit in the morning, fresh cut up fruit, and she puts homemade applesauce on top of it. Nothing in the applesauce, it's just apples. So I have that for breakfast, then I go down, my home is a a converted barn, and oh, inside nice. the barn, I have a swimming pool. I have a swimming pool because I'm in New York State, not in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I go down, and I do 30 minutes of serious exercise in the pool, not swimming laps. I do it with weights and back and forth and high knee jogs and do all that stuff, 30 minutes, whether I want to or not. Mm -hmm. Then I come up, shower, change for the day, and I'm ready to ready to go. But it, it's you making your run. It's, I think, a little bit of discipline doing things like that are really good for you. Making my bed is good for me in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's That's important, too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, you know what's kind of funny is there's um, – have you ever seen the, the Mr. Rogers documentary on Fred Rogers? Won't You Be My Neighbor? Yes, I know I did. Uh, I, of course. Uh, I loved it. Loved it. And one of the things that earlier when you were chatting, I was like, there's 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 a part of your mindset that reminds me a bit of Fred Rogers. And, you know, he talked about every morning he would go for a swim and he would weigh himself every morning after his swim. And like clockwork, his weight was always one hundred and forty three, like one hundred and forty three pounds. He was he was that same weight for decades. Right. And in his <laughs> mind, you know, one, four, three meant I love you. Like I has one letter. Love has four letters. You has three letters. Uh, one, four, three. So he would step on the neat. scale. I like that. He would see one, four, like three that. and think to himself, I love you. And that's kind of part of that ethos that permeated through Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And uh, th this is this is beautiful here in that you wake up every morning, you do 30 minutes of exercise in the pool. And in, in a second, I'm going to ask you about a couple of those exercises. I know you said high knees and some things like that, but I'm sure our listeners mm -hmm. would be would be fascinated. Um, so okay. you do fresh fruit with homemade applesauce. Is it is that because you want to use like organic apples and keep it fresh? Um no. We buy, we buy, you know, we're, we're an apple country, and so we buy all different kinds of apples, and Esther makes them, and she adds nothing to the apples. No no artificial sweeteners, no water, no nothing. It is just apples. Mm -hmm. And so so I have an applesauce on top of a mixture this morning. There were pineapple and melon and grapes and strawberries mm. in my fruit this morning and it's a double portion of fruit now then i don't have lunch per se i have a full dinner sometime between 2 30 and 4 o'clock and I, mm -hmm. I mean a real dinner it's everything and that's mm -hmm. it the two meals a day lovely I that's lovely enough. i like that that almost gives you like a little bit of a fast during the day and can help your mind stay sharp where you're not, you know, a lot of people go and they get themselves like a sandwich for lunch or something like that, and then find themselves in a food coma. And then they're in line at Starbucks to try to offset what they ate for lunch. And, and no, I like, no, I like that a lot. Can't, can't do it. Yeah. And what time do you wake up in the morning? Uh, norm, I, it's funny. I said, I always set the alarm because mm -hmm. I think, just in case I'll set the alarm and I always wake up before the alarm. Me so too. I'm I'm generally up out of bed anytime from six thirty to seven thirty is the, the norm. Nice. You know, so I'm always out of bed by seven fifteen, seven thirty at the latest. And then get get moving. And then what time do you go to bed at night typically? I try to I try 
if at all possible, to be getting into my bed at 930 at night so that I can read for an hour before I turn off the lights and everything and, and concentrate on sleep. But I need one hour of reading. Yeah. That to me is the real luxury of the day <laughs> of reading. And I, and if possible, I, tr- I try to make it to read something that is moving, that's terrific, that's great literature, that's a wonderful book, something. It's, a, it's such a huge variety. <laughs> What two questions? Uh, yeah, oh, and the other night, mm-hmm. the other night I stayed up till eleven o'clock, which for me is almost impossible. They had on um, Turner Classics. They had Out of Africa, which oh. I hadn't seen since it came out, and I, I, I watched it because I got to live that for about five days I went to a friend's. 20,000 acre game farm in Africa and lived in a, a cottage there. The, the, I had a bedroom cottage. He had his cottage. And then there was the main house with the veranda and we ate outside and we would, we would eat, have diner, be having dinner and a, a real word, a dazzle of zebras. That's what is a group of zebras is called. A dazzle? A dazzle of zebras would, would appear around the pond. And one day I went back to my cottage. I had been in the, in the pool, which was about 50 yards away from everything. And I went back to my cottage, and there was a, a baby hippopotamus asleep on the porch. <laughs> oh, my. And I, and I thought it was, it was magic. You know, that I, is... I, I watched that movie, and I, I, I got teary-eyed thinking about it. Oh my God! Perfect. I think I think I think I would uh, I'd, I'd be in heaven. <laughs> a little baby hit yeah, a lot of us. Was, oh, that sounds so cool! Incre- incredible. My my grandpa yeah. used to go on some epic trips like that. He would he'd go to uh, the Galapagos and and help uh, mm. maybe sea turtles and and different things right. like that. And I'm like I'm starting to feel the itch to engage in more of those like adventure trips. Um, cause that sounds like so much fun now. Um, yes, do that. Now you can't do it at 86. Yeah. I don't want adventure trips. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I really don't. I, you know, and I, and I, and I actually, as much as I love cruises, I don't really want to go on a cruise right now because there's too much emphasis on food and drink. Yeah, totally. I don't drink anymore. I stopped drinking at age 80. I, <laughs> really? I, you know, I love food. I love food, but I don't want to eat all day long. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fantastic. The, I, I will, you know, I'm not a big fan of the, I don't want to, I'm not into getting nose swabbed and playing all those things that they're making people do in order to travel. So if, if there's a cool place that I could go and I don't have to deal with that, I, I'm, I'm open to it, you know? Um, right. You're you're 30 minutes of exercise in the pool. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit for, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'd like to hear more. Okay. Um, back about four years ago, I was knocked, knocked over. I was out taking photographs of fireworks one night in a, in a town three hours away from Acapulco with dirt roads and somebody bumped into me, probably a drunk. And I just fell down, not falling downstairs, and broke my femur in four places. So I had bad Mexican surgery, was in bed for eight weeks, flew home, had more surgery. So I, I've i constantly done a PT to keep that leg very healthy, which it is. So the basic exercise I do, I do it in shoulder-deep water with high knee jogs, which are easy on the joints when you do it in the pool Mm -hmm. you know as you get older pools are very wonderful and i do my arms like this using the water as resistance so i'm exercising the upper half doing this doing high knee jogs down below then i get weights and i do various exercises with the weights Mm -hmm. for about 200, 300 jogs. So you're moving your then arms some, for, for the people who are audio only, you're moving your arms out almost like an expansive chest stretch and then, and then 
contracting or yeah. like and like a bird the water flying. is resistance mm-hmm. yeah you know the water is resistant so yeah. you have the water coming back and forth and then uh, then i do where i'm uh, uh still jogging but kicking up one knee in one direction and the other in the other in the other direction back and forth mm-hmm. doing the arms back and forth and exercising my fingers in the water i'm a rider so I, my hands are very important to me. Mm-hmm. So I keep those exercises too. And it, it works out fine. And if I don't do it, I really can feel it. So I do it every morning. The only the only day that I sometimes don't do it because I go early, I go to church early because I sing in the choir. I go oh, there nice. to get there early enough to do choir rehearsal mm-hmm. and then church. And then we have a little more rehearsal after and then I come home. Uh, I'll... I'll I'll laugh. I'll tell you about it because it's kind of fun. I'm an elder, meaning I'm on the board of mm-hmm. a Presbyterian congregation. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I help call the shots in the church besides singing the choir. And the, and I belong to that congregation because the minister is a Yale scholar and he's absolutely brilliant. He's a totally brilliant, brilliant man. I love to listen to his sermons. So, I'm there. I have a rabbi friend who calls me a collapsed Catholic. <laughs> I like very much. And and I asked a, a priest buddy of mine, I said, you know, Kent, Father Kent, does it really matter? Does God really care where we sing and pray as long as we sing and pray? And he said, no, I don't think I agree with you, Jim. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, I, so I've been a Catholic. Now I'm a Presbyterian. And if anything ever happened to our minister, I think I'd probably try Jewish because my rabbi friend is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's good to have a, some kind of spiritual hold in your system. You know, I mean, if for Hey, I totally accept the fact there are agnostics and, and atheists. That's fine. If they really believe that we evolved from fish, <laughs> when I look at a, a, a bookshelf full of great books or listen to Mozart or, mm-hmm. or see Picasso paintings, I think that came out of a fish. But <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's absurd when it's you okay. dig deeper. There's, there's actually this yeah. great, great yeah, book it, called uh, The Language of God by uh, Francis Collins. Mm. Francis Collins is the head of the Human Genome Project. And he wrote this book because he found so many people in the scientific community would write off uh, the case for God and and divine creation because they didn't feel it was scientific and, and vice versa. You know, a lot of a lot of people that were uh, creationists. I don't even know if creationists is the right word, but they believed that God created the universe. They would rely on things that were perhaps not compatible or seen as scientific. And he's like, these two things are not mutually exclusive. There actually is. He goes, the more I've dug deeper in literally mapping out the human genome, the more I realize it's impossible for this to have not been created by universal Mm -hmm. intelligence, God, you know, whatever you want to call it. And that's that's sort of what the book is about. He he presents the case that they're not mutually exclusive. And and uh, it's it's a pretty good book. And God created the science also, and Mm -hmm. scientists, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the inventive minds, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. yeah, we had to come, we had to come from somewhere, there had to be more than just one big bright burst of light in the the universe. Yeah, where'd that come from? (laughs) You know, it's like, the further back you go, the more it's like, okay, the answer's God. (laughs) Right. Um, the weights, are you using like the same type of dumbbell weights that you would use at a gym or something else? Dope, dopey little one. And uh, this really sounds very mousy, but it's at my age, I think it's enough. I'm using right now and they're mine are waterproof Mm -hmm. because they're underwater half the time. Uh, I'm using, uh, five pound weights. When I was younger, I was using seven or 10 pound weights. Mm-hmm. Now I'm at five pounders each, which is quite enough. You know, people say, oh, they're only five pounds. I say, fine, I want you to do it. <laughs> I want you to go and do that for a while. Mm-hmm. You'd be amazed the difference of putting five pounds in each hand. 
of what that does to you. Yeah. Um, but and that's fine. Yeah, just plain old weights. I had them down in Acapulco in our villa outside, and I keep them here in my home. That's beautiful. I um, I tore my pectoral muscle in 2016 wrestling with uh, my my friend and business partner, Russell Brunson, who is like, I think he took second in the country uh, in college for wrestling. And we, you know, we were just like, I was having a good, (laughs) having a good time kind of fighting him off. And he was kind of playing around with me and, and, and we got tangled up. And when we hit the, when we hit the mat, my, I felt a pop in my right pectoral Mm -hmm. and I was like, Ooh, that didn't, that didn't feel like something I've experienced before. And then when I went to like push him, I couldn't, I couldn't push with the right side of my body. And part of the rehab process was I got these gloves that, that Speedo makes that are basically like they take your hand and they make them webbed. So they put a webbing between your fingers and I would use those in, in the pool or whenever possible in the lake, um, for added resistance. And I'd go through those, mo- some of those movements that you were just showing me. And, you know, I came across this, this amazing video of a pool workout from, uh, the former King of Pancreas and UFC heavyweight champion, Boss Rutten, who had uh, a shoulder surgery and he developed this whole pool routine. And, and it was him that kind of turned me onto those gloves. So I like it. I actually, you've, you've inspired me to add a pool workout day to my uh, weekly training split. And I'm going to integrate some weights and I'm going to integrate those gloves. And, really and good. I like the idea of those gloves too. I'm, I'm going to look for those. Although, although I do it with my hands. What, what I turn my hands into gloves. To do yeah. That. There you go. You know? There you go. That's Lovely. Fine. Okay. So um, mm-hmm. dear old friends, is that, is that available at James B It is. That's my website. Uh, which will also introduce the other two books, the uh, two novels at the same time, James B. F. L. A. H. E. R. T. Y. dot com. And uh, there's a, a new addition to the website where they can just click on the book and it will take them right to the book link and everything. Love it. Love it. Um, let's talk a little bit about your golden rule. Okay. Golden rule. I've, I'm going to go back to uh, my sainted mother who raised me w- with the golden rule. She was a great believer in it. And, and I liked the idea of it. And as I got older, I said, you know, mother, if you lay that on a four or a five-year-old, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, they're going to say, huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just awkward language. It is. Know, you know, the whole idea is the golden rule started back 400, 500 B.C. Mm-hmm. And then Confucius put it together a little closer and then it evolved over the years into this wonderful, awkward phrase that still exists. So I rewrote it. Uh, just five words. Mm-hmm. Two of them are four letter words. And people said, yeah, it's typical of you, Flaherty, to put in two four letter words i said there are a lot of good four letter words mm-hmm. help love save pray those are all four letter mm-hmm. words as well uh, but mine is you get what you give and my explanation of that to my children who still use it with their so i have four millennial grandsons and one great grandson the handsomest of them all he's half japanese Mm-hmm. lives in Japan. Uh, you get what you give. If you give a helping hand, if you give a sympathetic ear, a generous heart, a warm embrace, you get it back. Always. If all you give is criticism, mm-hmm. demands, complaints, ugly, depression, Mm -hmm. you get that back too. It comes back and bites you, you know where, Mm -hmm. you know, and people, and I'm going to throw a rock at some of 
the elderly people. Sometimes elderly people get that way. They get to, well, rah, 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 rah. I want this and I want that. And if you don't do this, and, and then they wonder why their grandchildren don't call them except once every other year. <laughs> or they, or they're not, their children don't walk in with a big smile saying, how are you, mom? How are mm-hmm. you, dad? Mm-hmm. They, you know, people make it, make it harder on themselves. They make life harder on themselves. Because you do get what you give. I say to people, try it yourself. The next time you're in the supermarket, those are not, those are thankless jobs. The ladies taking the things and running them through the, the, the machine to check the price of it and putting it, putting it in your bag. Look at her and smile and say, thank you. Aren't you nice to do that? I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. It makes the day that much better. And, Chances are she's going to smile back at you mm-hmm. and you will have made her day that much better and that much more productive because you're going to say to herself, hmm, maybe she won't say it, but she'll think it inside of herself. Life isn't that bad. Not everybody is, <laughs> is dopey and ugly. Mm-hmm. Some people smile. I, you know, I still at my age, I open doors for people and now I laugh. I forget that I am, quote, elderly, so people open doors for me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I'm always so surprised, but I say, oh, thank you. I I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. I mean, life life doesn't have to be one crisis after another. Mm -hmm. You know, it really can be... How much pleasure can you give? How much pleasure can you share? And then it does come back to you. Mm-hmm. And then your own life is better. You can say, ah, I did something good today besides feed my own face and <laughs> take care of myself. Yeah. That's beautiful. Right? Yeah. And I mean, I see so many people now that are, you know, they're, they're, brainstorming different businesses that they could start and they've got these, these ideas and things that they want to do, but they, they're only thinking in terms of money. And, and I feel like, I mean, for me, when I first started doing health coaching, I would work with anyone who would accept help and, and was willing to put in the work required to transform and achieve the things that they wanted to achieve. And it allowed me to really start to, the major point. yeah, no, go ahead. No, the major point that you just made that they were willing to do it. Oh yeah. I would make People sure. You yeah. must understand if you want, if you want to have a better life, you must create it. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't say, well, here I am today. So come on, Clint Clementy. Create my life for me, will you? Totally, totally. No, it, it's up to me. It's, I have to play the hands I've been dealt. Yeah, right. for sure, for sure. And I think it's important where so much of this is is energetic and spiritual, where if, if we stop thinking in terms of just money, oh, how much money do I want to make? I want a seven-figure business. I want a six-figure business. I want to make an extra, you know, thousand dollars a month. Whatever it is, if you instead said, "What would what would I do for free that would light me up, that would allow me to connect with people I care about and have a positive impact on this world?" And I'm willing to do it for free to start, so that I could develop a skill set that down the line is even more valuable to other people. It lets you put in the reps that are required. It lets you encounter the, the, the challenges and the, the troubleshooting in order to really, to really help people. And it's far more effective to just roll up your sleeves and start doing good. Or as you would say, uh, you get what you give, start giving more to people. Absolutely, and, and stop just brainstorming business ideas. Get your business idea, and then go start giving it to people for free, and you will get so good that you eventually have a very real business there. You just reminded me of that with some of your philosophies and things. I also, by the way, I'm a great believer 
what you can't always do in life is I call it crap shooting with your life. <laughs> there are times I I'm not a gambler. I, it's hard for me. Me, I, me I neither. I always I always say, well, I'm I'm basically remember, Jim, you're you're just a, a, a little middle class guy, and so therefore you won't but bet ten dollars on something. But I would, and I had a, a partner, good partner, and we we made a terrific partnership out of it. We would gamble. We would buy something for. Three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> not knowing whether or not we would be able to turn it into a money-making property. Mm -hmm. But we did. It was crap shooting with our life. Buying the inn, the inn was not part of a a plan. It's called Trout Trout Peck. It's still very beautiful. The new owners are wonderful people, and they're doing a beautiful job with it. But we really bought an abandoned stack of stone in a town that nobody had even heard of. <laughs> Amenia, New York, where I still live. Mm -hmm. like I told you we call it anemia or amnesia. <laughs> but it's a, a funny little town, 82 miles due north of Manhattan, in a very pretty part of America where New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts all bump up next to each other. It's mm -hmm. called the foothills of the Berkshires. It's uh, very attractive. But that was crap shooting. Mm -hmm. Would we buy something and start a business that I knew nothing about? Mm -hmm. And I gave up advertising when I was about at the top of the mountain and could call my own shots. And I said, well, life is short and <laughs> maybe this will be interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went on working the first two or three years, have enough money to pay the salary from the country. But then it started to work. Mm -hmm. It was a successful business. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another crap shooting with my life was when I accepted the job offer to move to Argentina to move mm -hmm. 6,500 miles with my wife and two little girls ages 9 and 11. And we moved and lived with the Peronistas. And we, while we were in Argentina, Juan Domingo Perón returned. <laughs> and the Argentines re-elected him. It would be like the Germans re-electing Hitler. And they re-elected Perón as president. I mean, it was Barnum and Bailey time every day. But <laughs> I wouldn't have given it up. It was a great experience. And we are all uh, bilingual in the family. We still oh, that's are. That's great. <laughs> uh, and we travel, and with the kids, we traveled all over South America. I, you know, they've climbed all through Machu Picchu and <laughs> done everything. I'd taken them to Europe earlier, but um, so I think that's important. Um, I've heard Machu Picchu is, is legendary. I'd love to check it out at, uh, at some point. It just, you think, how the hell did they do that? How mm -hmm. did they get all of those giant stones up in the mountains? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a place to go if you're old or in fragile health. First of all, the the, the at the bottom of the mountain, I think the altitude is, is you know, 8,000 feet. So the <laughs> air is thin, and then you're going to go up even higher. And mm -hmm. when you take one of the little local airlines out of there, for the first 30 minutes, the scenery is higher than the than the airplane, which does not really make you feel comfortable as you're flying <laughs> in and out around mountains to get up there. But God, it was it was exciting. You know, it really was. It was a uh, just living in South America was exciting. Argentina was Spanish speaking Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very quite wonderful. Yeah. Very, uh, that sounds great. Rough. <laughs> um, what, what else is important to me? What else from your from I your? Know. Oh yeah, go ahead. From the book, yeah, something that I and I I believe in it for everybody, no matter who you are, even people who have a job. If the you know unless the, unless their job is their passion, and there is a time in your life, I mean passions change. There is a time in your life. When your wife or your husband is your passion, or your <laughs> children are your passion, or your your job, your career is a passion, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But eventually, especially as you get older, and some of those other things are not 
in the number one position. You need a passion. You need a reason to get up every day and say, damn, I got it another day. And in the book, I have a chapter called The, the Importance of Passion. And I'm, and I'm saying, you can paint. You can learn to make jewelry. You can write. Not easy, but you can write. You'd be mm-hmm. amazed how many people are writing their first book at age 50, 60, 70. Mm-hmm. You can counsel others. You can, you know, you could, a woman who's gotten over breast cancer could go in the hospital and be a great help to other women who are suffering. Mm-hmm. You can do church work. You can start a business. You can, I, oh, a friend of mine, you'd love her. She's 83 years old and she's gone back to college. <laughs> I said, Jim, I walk in the classroom and the kids look at me like, good God, it's Grandma Moses reincarnated. <laughs> you know? And I think I'm getting more out of the classes than they are, but I've become friends with them. They invite me to the library. She said, do you like what I'm wearing? I went to the Gap with my friends. <laughs> she's 83 years old and she's having the time of her life mm-hmm. and getting her first college degree, you know, which I think is terrific. That is terrific. If, if money allows, you can travel. There's nothing like travel. Volunteer work, everybody needs volunteers, whether it's a hospital or a church, the the town, somebody does. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me recently they never knew how to swim. I said, I can't can't believe it. Everybody has to know how to swim. Learn how to swim. Go to the Y. Take swimming lessons. Mm -hmm. Learn how to play bridge. Now, boy, you want to stay away from dementia? If you can play bridge, that'll that'll keep you going. My my great uh, another, grandmother, I think a, a great passion. Learn a foreign language. People yeah. say, "Oh, I always wanted to speak French." I said, "Fine, study it for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. Study French and learn to speak French." I mean, I I I certainly I'm still very fluent in Spanish, and I find if when I was in Italy, that the Spanish would help me. I got along in Italian. I certainly can't speak it, but I, I, I totally agree. Most of it. I lived in Verona, you know, where, you can take where Romeo and Juliet courses. You can become yeah. a music lover, a fine art. You can join a book club. You can get a pet. <laughs> they're, they're all things that, that give people a reason for saying, good. Mm-hmm. Another day. Good God, another day. <laughs> yeah. It is. This past weekend, one of my friends, you know, we did, uh, it it was a good friend's birthday weekend in Austin. So about eight of us went and got together and we were at dinner. And one of the guys had, uh, he was sharing his story about kind of um, a, a God moment that really brought him back to his faith. And he was, he was telling the story and he'd actually gone through some very dark times leading up to it. And then as he kind of um, experienced his, his God moment afterwards, what he started doing without telling anybody is he would go to hospitals and he would talk to the people at the front desk and he would say, is it all right if I offer anyone who would like help to come in and talk with them and maybe say a prayer for them and just spend a little bit of time with them? You know, whether that's someone that's dealing with something terminal, someone who's in a rough situation, someone who needs a little bit of inspiration and love and attention or just companionship. And he would spend hours at the hospital. He wouldn't tell anybody, but he was like, this is something nice that I can do for my brothers and sisters of all different ages. And uh, I thought it was just such a such a beautiful reflection of who he is as a person, you know, and that was one of the things that when his wife met him and and found out he was doing that, uh, she was like, I want to spend the rest of my life with this guy. Of course. You, it goes back to what I said, Anthony. You get what you give. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's giving and sharing and saying, let's, let's be happy. Let's, every, every day is a miracle. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in this terrible world, I think of the, the hideousness of the poor people in Ukraine and what they're going through. And Mm -hmm. when I, and I know people who lived through, who really were living in and lived through world war two. And I think how fortunate we are living here in our wonderful country where we've had freedom. Maybe some some people would say too much freedom, (laughs) but we have not had to live in war. And I think, Mm -hmm. 
we should we all should feel blessed and we should all be able to say every day is a miracle how lucky we are to be here and i hear it from my nanny who, who says how happy she is she said i'm an american now and i can vote <laughs> and i can <laughs> do all these things and she's just as cute as can be I'm so happy mm-hmm. about it yeah that's so, great when i mean you talked a little bit about discipline earlier and i one of the areas that that so many people struggle is they don't feel like working out especially in the morning you know maybe maybe their body hurts maybe it it just requires a level of willpower and discipline that they think other people have but they don't um what is your sort of psychological approach i know you said you're going to you said you do it whether you feel like it or not but maybe you can elaborate a but bit most days I, yeah okay most days i feel like it i i i realize now i've been doing it now so long that I absolutely feel like it. And I've talked to my friend. <laughs> my friends are funny. They say, all right, I, I admit these are not wonderful character personality characteristics. I am a uh, I'm judgmental and bossy. And all mm-hmm. my friends say, all right, Jim. All right, I'll tell you all the stupid things I've done. And then you can tell me why I'm an idiot and what I should do about them. Mm-hmm. Or would you just... Don't talk to me. Don't tell me what to do. And then they'll turn right around and ask me what should they do about their problems because they know mm-hmm. I will have a solution or at least a suggestion of what they should do. Mm-hmm. I say, if you really hate the idea, they do make wonderful, wonderful exercise machines that aren't painful. They have bicycles that are not, it's not painful to sit in them. You can put mm-hmm. set up a bike in front of a TV mm-hmm. and put on something you like on television mm-hmm. and you can exercise and give yourself and schedule it. Say, mm-hmm. I've got to do this every day for 20 minutes. I said, and a lot of the aches and pains will go away because you know that, you know, science tells us that if you do at least 20 or 30 minutes of exercise three times a week, you're going to live longer. You're mm-hmm. going to be healthier. Mm-hmm. I started doing that on my own before science told me you really should do it. And I realized how much better I felt. I just plain feel better. I mean, I really, honest to God, Anthony, I do not wake up in pain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just think good. There's... The other day, I, I, I acknowledge my age. Mm-hmm. I know my age. I know that I'm not going to go out and do stupid things. <laughs> you know? And I don't, where before I, I used to love to walk all over Manhattan. Now I'm, when I'm in New York, I'm annoyed if I've got to walk past the corner <laughs> because I, I really don't want to walk on cement anymore. Mm-hmm. Don't want to do it. Okay, fine. But I'm getting my exercise anyway. Totally. And you're so right. There's people will say, you know, my knee hurts or my back hurts. Um, But you have like the pool workouts that you mentioned, the exercise bikes that you mentioned, you could get on an elliptical, you could sauna. There's so many options where if your mindset Mm. is, if there, if I will find a way and I'm going to get this done no matter what, not with, not well hurting yourself, it doesn't need to come at the expense mm-hmm. of your of your uh, of pain in your body. There's ways to do it without pain. And as you get going, as you said, the pain goes away, and you're a lot and more motivated. Can... If 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 you have committed to training, let's say six days a week, seven days a week, and you're going to do it no matter what, mm-hmm. you're a lot more motivated to find out where that inflammation and pain is coming from. Maybe it's the food you're eating, you know. And then if, if you're going to show up and do your workout, well, then you're going to be looking at what you're putting in your mouth and like, is it possible that this pizza is contributing to my pain? Is it possible that the booze I'm having, you know, a couple times a week is contributing to my pain? You start looking for those things rather than just saying, oh, my knee hurts. Oh, my back hurts. I'm not going to do it. Other people have more discipline and willpower than I do. I'm not going to do it, you know? I know when I hear p- people talk, say, well, I'm, I'm really having a lot of respiratory problems. And I and they're telling me this as they light up a cigarette. <laughs> <I> say, <laughs> you know, I know that you're 
educated and I and you read and you really are going on smoking. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really do that? I I gave it up. I, as I told you, the year before it caused cancer, they they announced it the year after I stopped that it was bad for you because I didn't want my children to smoke, and neither one of them smoked. They said, Good. "Well, Dad, we did a little bit of pot." I, mm. I didn't. Daddy was a non a non drug person, but the other. Good thing about doing exercise and taking care of yourself as you get older is that you're not. Then the only pills you take are your vitamins and the nutrients. I have a vegetable drink in the morning with protein and go Ruby go something in it, and I take all my vitamins and nutrients. And I don't take any pain pills. Mm-hmm. I don't take any pain pills at all. If I were, if I was in pain, yes, I would take them. I mm-hmm. go to my doctor. I get two physicals a year. I do what he tells me to do. You know, I've had I had bladder cancer. I've had rotator cuff surgery. I've had three operations on the the bad leg that was uh, broken. Big deal. Mm-hmm. But what you do? You get them. You fix them. <laughs> get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Then life goes on. Mm-hmm. That that supplement you said it's called Go Ruby Go. Yeah, there's a. There are a couple of supplements that are made, uh, I think, with a beet basis, mm-hmm. which is good for you because not many people eat many beets. Mm-hmm. I happen to have a very, very, and I trust me, it's not a boring diet at all, but I have a very healthy diet in that it's low carbs. Now and then, one, maybe once every two weeks, we'll have a pure pasta dinner because mm-hmm. we like pasta. Um but it's a lot of vegetables and a lot of salads, but great tasty things. I mean, I uh, the night before last, we had tenderloin of pork stuffed with brandied prunes, prunes mm. that had been soaking all night in brandy. And then uh, she made an orange sauce, a cooked orange sauce on top of it. That sounds we have bougie. Instead of mashed potatoes, we have uh, pureed cauliflower. Yeah. So we have a feeling of mashed potatoes. Now, and it really tasty food with with well spiced and uh, mm-hmm. really good stuff, which I like very much. Yeah, if if you were in a position where you had to say, "All right, this is my favorite meal of all time," what would it be? Probably, probably it would be as much as I love a perfect piece of steak. Mm, me too. Do, it would probably be in, a, in the seafood category. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm saying seafood category because I can't say we we fix the healthiest fish of all is salmon. And we fix it two ways. There One, one is coated with pistachio nuts. And it really is incredibly good. But then uh, the other day, my afternoon dinner was shrimp and scallops and fish, I think it was cod, in a tomato base, sautéed base with cut up peppers in it and some vegetables in it. And it was incredible. I mean, there could not be better food than that. Yeah. Better spice and better tasting. I, Of course, I'd love to have uh, fried calamari now and then. <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. I just don't do it every day. I, I, I can't do that. I want. I want to. I want to step on that scale and know that it's going to stay below one seventy, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. it does. Yeah, yeah. Always. What are your thoughts on? I mean, we're in a world today where there's so many diets. You've got the paleo diet. You've got the carnivore diet. You've got people eating vegan. You've got people eating low carb. You've got people eat. I mean, it, it, the list goes on and on and on. And, and it's mm. a, such a stark contrast from probably where things were when you were a kid <laughs> and, and even a young adult. Yeah, what are your a, thoughts on that? What do you think's going on? It's a, a trillion, it's a trillion dollar business. When my wife and I, one year, uh, they'd gone to Ireland to paint for the whole summer. And I went over to Ireland once and then we drove through Ireland for a week. We went to London for a week, Paris for a week, and we sailed home. This was, I was earning that year $35,000 a year. I mean, I thought I would, I had had it made. That was 
that's about 1970, maybe 1968. I thought I was richer than Croesus. <laughs> and we, we came home, that nice, young, plump couple at the end of the block. We both had gained, over the year, 20 or 30 pounds. And we went out and bought the original cookbook from Weight Watchers. And we, we swore, we agreed that we would follow it by the letter of the law for three months. We each lost 30 pounds doing it. Nice. Other than that, I've never gone on the diet. It kills me, by the way. I have, I have a couple of friends who, who went from very normal size people from very seductive looking people to extremely large people. And I can't say anything about it because that's their life choice to do that. Um, when we first moved to Acapulco, uh, the first winter, I gained 15 pounds, I guess, margaritas and other things like that. And I said, that's ridiculous. And I bought Suzanne Summers had, had a cookbook or book out then called Eat Great, Lose Weight. And it was based on the old French premise of when you eat fats and proteins, you don't have any carbohydrates. And when you mm -hmm. eat carbohydrates, you don't have fats and proteins, and you only eat fruit on an empty stomach. And I thought, good idea, easy to follow, you're never hungry. And I lost 15 or 20 pounds doing it, in spite of, and her diet didn't say, and you can have a margarita and a glass of wine, which I was still having in those days. Um, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about the diets. I think for some people, Anthony, they are very necessary because people need to have an authority saying to them, no, you can't eat that. You must eat this. I know, obviously, my own diet is very healthy. I know it because I'm mm -hmm. taking the right nutrients and I'm eating basically fruits, fruit all by itself. And then I'm having good sources of proteins and a lot of vegetables and a lot of salads. And my system is perfectly happy with that. Mm -hmm. But that's my choice, my decision. I don't have to buy a diet for it. I think for many people, they have to buy it because it's a matter of somebody saying, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. They can't make that decision. I, I think it's amazing what they have now for food outside of diets. If you're a single person living alone, you can have some of these services deliver finished plated foods to you. Mm -hmm. dinners you know That's... you can order off of a menu and you get food for the whole week mm -hmm. and they're pretty decent meals nice yeah. meals so there's some good ones i don't know i i can't talk about the cost of them because i don't do that but, they're reasonable um, too there are some reasonable ones yeah i know i mean so people really don't have to cook <laughs> they mm -hmm. don't want to which is too bad i think cooking is one of the great arts <laughs> what's jim what's your favorite story of all time that you tell that maybe you've, you've told mm. to, you've either told it to a lot of people or just a small group of people, but it's your favorite, favorite story of all time to tell. Okay. I think favorite stories have to follow, have, have to come out of different parts of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I won't tell stories of raising children because there were moments when I absolutely adored having children. And by the way, Anthony, don't have children unless you absolutely want to have children. People yeah. say to me, is it terrible that I don't want to have children? I say, no, for God's sake, don't, because children are an absolute pain in the neck. And they go on being a pain in the neck, but bigger as they, they get bigger. doesn't matter. I couldn't fathom my life without my children. I absolutely love them, but we have a lot of distance between us. <laughs> We're not, mm -hmm. I'm not depending on their call. They're not depending on me. They've been raised to be independent creatures, mm -hmm. which they are, and I love them dearly, but I, I count on them. So a story I like, this comes out of wanting to do something, uh, a, a bucket list thing that I did at about age Hmm. 15 years ago. So I was about 70 years old. Then uh, we came into some money that I didn't expect, sold a piece of property. And I said, good. 
I know what I want to do with it. I've never been to Southeast Asia, and I'm, uh, I really feel I've missed something in my life. I said, but I don't want to do it flying coach. <laughs> I don't want to do anything coach. So I got two ladies in a travel business, and they planned a five-star meal, a five-star trip, a seven-and-a-half-week trip to Southeast Asia. Oh, wow. So I, I did that. And it was with a company back then called Abercrombie and Kent, I believe. And everywhere we were, there was a nanny to go to the ticket counter to get the airline tickets. And at the corner, there was a Mercedes and a driver. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and closed museums would be opened just so that we could go in and see it. And I had seven and a half weeks to soak up Asia. And it was wonderful. It was terrific. I went back other times. I've been to China two or three times. And uh, that that is a, a remembrance that I like very much. I remember walking through Tiananmen Square and a, a little tiny girl came up. Uh, I was traveling with my partner and a, a, another couple came up and patted my partner on the tummy and said, Happy Buddha. <laughs> and the next day we, fl- we flew up to I think it's called Cheyenne. I'm not sure where they had the something else I want, absolutely had to see the the uh, terracotta soldiers, an entire army of terracotta, Whoa. life-size soldiers and life-size chariots with horses, all life-size, all sculpted in terracotta. So Whoa. we went up to see that. And in the store there, they had a happy Buddha about – Yay, so big, made of solid onyx, <laughs> oh. which I bought. <laughs> yeah. Now, Baller move. Jewelry grade onyx, but it's solid onyx, one, one piece. Yeah, I'd imagine so, that was pretty I inexpensive. Of, <laughs> I have a lot of stuff from Asia, from everywhere. Everywhere we went, we bought art. Mm-hmm. That was the other, other thing I did, did for myself. I loved art. So our memories of places are the art that's hanging on the walls. And Mm -hmm. the house is a barn, so I've got big walls and a lot of art. That's great. What's what's your favorite book or books of all time? What are your favorite books of all time, or what's your favorite book of all time? Wow, that's it's so hard when you read everything. You know, I'm I'm a great believer that to be a writer, what the first thing you have to do to be a writer is read. I think mm-hmm. it was Faulkner who said that. Read and then read and read and read some more. And then when you read enough, you'll know when you write something, you'll know whether it's crap and you can throw it out. Because <laughs> if you read enough, you'll you'll feel the magic of good writers mm-hmm. around you. You know, I'm, so um, lately I, I read one. I, I, I think, it's, yeah, his last name was Carol. From the, from the Dragon's Teeth. I never heard of it. Mm-hmm. Brilliantly written. One that a lot of people have been talking about the last few years. A a gentleman or the gentleman in Moscow. If you've not heard of that book, um, by strange name, his the man's name is Amor A M O R Towels T O W L E S, and it's called The Gentleman in Moscow, and it's. A brilliant book and brilliantly written. I'm also a great admirer. I love women authors. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, whose fifth book she wrote to help herself get over her own emotional problems, and it became a worldwide bestseller and a, and a sterling movie, which was um, Eat, Pray, Love. I wrote that, that down Elizabeth earlier Gilbert. in our conversation when you were talking about great four-letter words. Uh, eat, eat, eat doesn't get it done, but pray and love. <laughs> no, but but her books, Elizabeth Gilbert, anything she writes is worthwhile. By the way, look her up on YouTube. Also, she's charming. She could have her way with me any minute. Uh, <laughs> she wrote one book, a, a nonfiction for creative people called Big Magic. And it's terrific book. You, I'm sure you would like it, Anthony. It's about... When when the good idea, when the creative idea comes to you, how to grab it, how to, I don't know, it's, it's, it's wonderful writing. Uh, that sounds great. I'll, like I'll that pick it up. Terrific. Then, then we've got the great authors, you know, I, I, 
somebody I hadn't read for years, Herman Woke. I I found a book that I'd always heard of and I'd never read it, Young Blood Hawk. And it was terrific. It's a terrific, terrific novel. Um, These are great. I should read a missioner a missioner book in their life. A missioner says, I love it. He said, I, in six pages, I can't even say hello. <laughs> you know, missioner <laughs> books are very long. Yeah. They're history. They're history written in beautiful novels. I read Chesapeake recently, and I learned all about the eastern seaboard of America and its role in slavery and the importance of Quakers and all kinds of good stuff. Um, That's and, cool. You know, it's Let, hard to pick any one yeah, particular I, book. That's no. this is a, this is a great list, and I haven't read any of these, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be on uh, on the internet afterwards picking them up. I wrote down the two books you mentioned too, by the way. I, uh, I like, Jim, I like I'll be back in thirty those. seconds. I've I'm gonna go to the washroom, and then we'll we'll kind of land the plane. But I uh, I have to go quite urgently, and then we'll continue our conversation. Good. We'll edit it out, and, and I'll be back in thirty seconds. In thirty seconds, okay, I'm with you. Beautiful. I, I really appreciate your time as well and everything that you're you're sharing, your generosity. Um, We're back. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very that was very necessary. <laughs> it's, it's totally understood. Remember, I'm an elderly person. <laughs> I never, never, ever more than. 15 feet from a bathroom. <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted you to know that I wasn't always 86. I, f I found a picture of me in my Mad Men days. <laughs> this is Oh wow. This is Mad this is Mad Men. Mad Men Mad Men Flaherty. That is great. You've got you got the suit. You're you're buttoned up. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And how I always how, was dressed. How young do you think so, you were in that picture? <laughs> Oh, I had to be in my, I had to be at least 50. Yeah. At least. That's great. Yeah. That is great. Um, Jim, you've shared some, some fantastic books, a lot of amazing wisdom. And, you know, in a, in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity if there's anything else that you feel called to share with our listeners or, or that you'd like to discuss. But before that, I'm, I'm very curious. <laughs> what, what are your favorite films? Film or films? Movies. Well, did I did I just tell you that the other night I watched... Um, out of Africa. Out of Africa? Yes. Yeah, I saw that, which I, I thought was just unbelievably uh, wonderful. Uh, I, and there was a time in my life also, because I was a New Yorker, you know, the... the the joke was you didn't have to read New York Magazine or The New Yorker to find out the best restaurant, the best books, the best play. You could just ask Jim because old smartass Flaherty knew everything. And I've been to every play that ever existed. I mean, I, I saw during my honeymoon in New York, my four-day honeymoon from my $80 a month 
job in the army, uh, we saw the original My Fair Lady. Mm. Then I saw in 1957 the first production of West Side Story. Oh, wow. Everybody in New York was out of their minds talking about West Side Story. You know, now everybody in the world knows it, but back then it was such to see hoodlums. I, the, the joke was... I, it, maybe it was a New Yorker cartoon or the joke, the two little Jewish ladies talking and one said, have you seen this, this thing, this West Side Story? She, and the other one said, where are you going to find hoodlums? What can dance like that? <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. You know, yeah. so I remember that. I saw West Side Story and MAME and a lot of wonderful Broadway back then and when when I could understand Broadway. I don't totally understand all of it now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I got gotcha. you. Um, so, um, guys, if, what if, did if, you ask me? Did any, any other favorite movies or favorite films that, that you know, you've loved that have had a, a positive impact on you or that you just, that just gave you a lot of joy? Now I'm finding uh, now I'm, to find a couple things, even since we now live in a remember, I, I was I grew up without television. My mm-hmm. mother bought a TV in 1951, the first TV on the block, so that we could watch the presidential um, campaign. She said, "I think it'll be good education for you." Mm-hmm. So I was 15 years old then. Uh, it was the year after Dad died. Now I find on television you find things like all creatures great and small. Now and then you find something that is really very, very tasty on TV. If you look through it all and and follow it all, you you find some wonderful things to watch. I haven't seen the current movies. Yeah, yeah. To tell the truth, I'm I'm just not up to date. I I watch the the Academy Awards and things, and I I don't recognize the actors. Yeah, (laughs) well, I'm with you there. Good, Jim. That's nice. You're you are getting on, getting on, I guess. And I guess part of it is I live in the country. I don't have big multi theater. I have to drive an hour to go to a big multi theater. There's a small movie house ten miles away, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there's the summer theater five you know five minutes away. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that's it. Mm-hmm. You live that's, in the country. Totally, when you're, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't. I don't. You know, allocate a lot of time each week to to movies or television but you know there's there are still some some great pieces of of uh art being produced um i want to i want to kind of give you the opportunity and if there's nothing that's okay you know we can kind of land the plane but is there anything else that you feel called to share with with myself with our listeners um that we haven't had the opportunity to touch on yet. Actually, uh, Anthony, I think that we've, we've uh, said it all. I mean, I, I, I am a strong believer that, that every day is an opportunity. It's not mm-hmm. just a miracle. Every day is an opportunity. I, I, I can't stress it enough with people. I don't want you to say, Oh God, I hope I can get through this day or I'm I'm bored with it and I'm bored with myself and I'm bored with everything around it. It can't be that. Mm-hmm. It just can't be that. You've got to say to yourself, wow, I have another chance. I have another, hopefully another 24 hours to be on this earth. And let me try to do something creative. Let me try to do something that's productive. Let me do something that's helpful that's all. I, I want people to. I want people to live, not to. Re- I want them to advance, not retreat. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, expand, not contract. If you're stuck in an, if you're stuck in an emotional traffic jam, try to find a side road and get the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get back on on track somehow. No, yeah, I, I see too many people doing it, especially as they're getting older, and it's it's tough for me to accept it, and they all know it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great point. I was in the the sauna the other day at this place called Chicago Sweat Lodge, 
by me. And uh, they have a Turkish bath and a, and a Russian dry sauna and a cold plunge pool that's 37 degrees. And you can kind of bounce wow. back and forth and, and, and socialize. And it's lovely. And th- I was in there with a couple of young, I say, I mean, they were, they were probably a, a decade or a decade and a half younger than I am uh, kids that, are, that were both uh, consultants. And I was like, how do you guys like what you do? And they both looked at me and they were like, hate it. You know, and I left, I left it alone at the time, but then a, a, a bit later, you know, we were kind of chatting in the locker room and, and I said, I've been there. And sometimes it's, it's scary to think like, well, I've got all these things that I need to afford and, and how am I going to afford them if I don't continue doing this thing that I hate? But those, those feelings can be our soul and our spirit and, you know, God, universal intelligence, whatever you want to call it, trying to communicate with us. And maybe part of the reason that we're feeling those, those, um, you know, those apprehensions around things is, is it's, it's our higher power, our higher selves nudging us to change something, to shake something up, you know, and, and, and so many people hate their jobs, but they're afraid to leave because they don't know how they're going to be able to afford all the toys or their mortgage or the stuff that, that that's, their family needs. That's so sad. I feel so sorry for people that can't, go to a, I w- went to a job commuting. We lived out in, in Westchester in a little town called Larchmont. I, I took a, a 645 train so that I could be at my desk by 745. Mm-hmm. Because again, that was that getting to work early. I'm a great believer that if you arrive someplace on time, you're late. You know, you, you should always, always be early. Mm-hmm. Never, never late. There's never any excuse for it. But mm-hmm. I feel so sorry for people who say, God, I hate my job. I think, find something new. Shoot craps with your life. Mm-hmm. You possibly can. You know, what? God, do something. I, yeah. Yeah. I not want to get up every day and. Cut down on expenses. Maybe it means you got to get a smaller home or a different car or mm-hmm. look at where all the money's going right. and say, all right, I can, I can create some freedom by making myself less beholden to all of these, these toys and things that I own that really just end up owning me. You know, Jim, this is, I've loved people this conversation. Ask me, people ask I'm, me, why don't I, why don't I buy a, a, a fancier car for myself? And I said, because I like my Chevy Blazer SUV, and mm-hmm. I still have my 2008 Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> Same year I did the the Southeast Asia trip, I bought myself a Jaguar, and I but I still have it. Yeah, three thousand miles on it. <laughs> That's awesome. This this is this has been a beautiful conversation, and and I want to thank you so much. I've enjoyed it, and you shared a lot, uh, and 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 I think our audience is really going to like it. And guys, if you do, please, you know, share it up, um, go to James B pick up, uh, pick up his books. You know what I mean? Connect with, uh, connect with him and check out some of the cool things he's working on. Uh, yeah, Jim, thank you so much. I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed thank our time. You, together. It's been, it's been great. It's been great fun. Yeah. Hope it we has. can do it again someday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. There's always room at the barn, and I keep the pool at 86 degrees, not 37. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Maybe maybe I'll take you up on it sometime. Okay, Fred. Great.